Hello my friends! Welcome to my lecture on Percy Bysshe Shelley. Uh, what I would recommend that you do, I'm going to break this uh, this video up into some sort of small chunks. They're going to be in order so do work work through them. Um, as you're watching or, or listening there's no need to keep an eye on my beautiful face. Um, but as you're as you're kind of listening make sure that you have these slides up so the slides will be on Moodle and I'll be talking through when we're when we're moving on and make sure you have some kind of uh, notes if you're if you're uh, taking notes on your laptop or, or, or whatever by all means feel free to minimize the video but um, if you're you know and if you're taking notes on paper you can probably work out how to do that so Percy by Shelley absolute hero of mine he's um, partially the focus of my PhD alongside his totally badass wife Mary Shelley author of Frankenstein um, he's a wonderful poet in my personal opinion I mean okay everyone in this course is kind of a wonderful poet but he's an extra wonderful poet. Um, I think a poet who can be quite difficult to get your head around when you're sort of looking at his poetry. It's very intricate, it's very rich, and sometimes you can be sort of staring at a poem and just going, I, it sounds lovely, but I don't know what you're talking about, Percy. So I'm gonna hopefully just work through some of them with you. So th to begin with, I will introduce um, him, his life, you know, a little bit of backstory. And then we will work through the poems and I'll try and talk about them in quite a bit of detail. If you're sort of really struggling, you don't know where to jump in, uh, Ode to the West Wind is a, a great poem and I think one that really repays um, a little bit of study. You know, it, it's, it's fairly short, it's fairly kind of uh, accessible. Mask of Anarchy is very direct, but it's quite long. Uh, I would say don't let that put you off. It is an absolute banger. Uh, so we got a lot, we will work through Let's dive straight in. So have a look, go down and just first slide, Percy Bear Shelley, that's the title of the lecture. Um, go down to our second slide here and you will see we've got uh, basically just an introduction to some ideas that we're going to be, uh, different ways we're going to be looking at Shelley. Um, and a lot of these I think are things to be considered and they're not necessarily things to be taken immediately at face value. This first thing, I put in quotes, second generation romantic. So he is very much of a generation with Byron and with Keats, um, born uh, 1792. So he's growing up in post-revolutionary England, so after the French Revolution. Um, they're a time when kind of... Uh, Radical forces are really agitating and conservative Britain is is trying, you know, conservative British monarchy, um, British government is really trying to maintain the principles that have held strong. And a lot of people are starting to worry, okay, well, the French Revolution went wrong. It didn't happen. Um, and a lot of people like Wordsworth and Coleridge are perhaps repenting their earlier radicalisms and saying, well, what happened in the revolution was really a warning. Uh, and then younger poets like Byron and Keats and, uh, and Shelley they haven't lived through that and so you know it's not that they're saying oh you know the french revolution was great we should totally do that but they're kind of trying to say well maybe we shouldn't just be accepting the status quo um uh, so we i've put second generation in kind of quotations because it is a, a distinction that is very commonly made but i think it is um it isn't a clear-cut thing and I don't think it's easy to say generation one think this and generation two think this. Byron and Shelley politically are very different. Um, they all know each other, by the way, particularly um, Byron, Shelley, Keats, uh, all, all kind of, you know, Shelley is, is, is very good friends with, with Byron particularly. Um, you know, they, they have their disagreements, they have their arguments at times, but they certainly spend a lot of time together and seem to have something very special. Um, you know, he, he knows Keats as well. Uh, so, but... Yes, they are, they are a unit in that they know each other very well in the way that Wordsworth and Coleridge and Co. all know each other very well. Um, it is not to say that these two different groups of people, these two different generations, have completely different ideologies. So be careful with that. And by all means, use it, but interrogate it while you're kind of, um, while you're doing so. The second point here, which is one that I think we should be reflecting on throughout, um, throughout the lecture, is a question. Um, do we consider Shelley an ineffectual angel or a red revolutionary? Okay, what does that mean? Um, these are basically two ways that Shelley has been looked at by, uh, by readers after his death. 
the idea of an ineffectual angel, um, it's, it's a quote uh, which I've, I've got in the next slides I'll come on to, but this is a very kind of Victorian idea that he was a very kind of ethereal, um, you know, wonderful ideas, but essentially just kind of reclining and thinking of ideas and not really being directly involved, um, not really being very useful, just being a pretty poet in a floppy shirt lying on a couch. Um, but in recent years, really kind of, um, I mean, actually starting about kind of the, the, the 80s, really, people have started to say, well, actually look at his political poetry. He's very passionate. He's very engaged. He is talking about the events of the time. And maybe we've been uh, considering him the wrong way to just think of him as this angelic poet who isn't really dealing with the events of the world. So keep that kind of dichotomy in mind as we go through and uh, decide what you want to say about him. Um, the politics of poetry, particularly when we get into defensive poetry, and defensive poetry is a great one to be using in your essays because it's very philosophical. So it, it is an essay rather than a poem. Um, but it's very philosophical and it's got all kinds of uh, moments of him striding forth and going, this is what poetry is. Um, this is what poets ought to do. So yes, go into, you know, go into this text pull out the bits, agree with them, disagree with them, but it is a really useful resource for your essays. And the final thing that we'll be thinking about is the figure of the poet, um, which is something that has dominated so much of what we've talked about in, um, in Romanticism, but like, who is the poet? What is the poet's role in society? Um, so often we have this first person voice coming through in Romantic poetry, uh, this I who thinks and feels, um, we often kind of see this as perhaps a, a lonely genius of some sort reflecting on the world in, in some way. Um, and how much is that to be read autobiographically and how much is it not? Most of Percy Shelley's, Percy Shelley's poems, certainly a, a great deal of them, have a speaker who is almost a character within it. And very often that speaker is only at the very beginning, a couple of lines at the beginning where he says, well, I was doing this thing and then this happened and then you get into the body of the poetry almost like a frame narrative um, and what is the effect of that particularly in light of kind of Byron's celebrity something Shelley did not have by the way to any extent um, but yeah how does that play in okay so the the facts of um, Percy Shelley's life will give you a, a little introduction to who he is and where he's coming from um, Born 19, uh, 1972, 1792, uh, dies 1822, so uh, he's the that younger generation, and, and like you know, we, this, these three that we think of as the younger generation, he died very young. He died just before his 30th birthday. Um, so, I mean, he, that means he is outlived. He, Byron, and Keats are all outlived by Wordsworth and Coleridge. Um, like Byron, he spends much of his adult life in exile out of England, feeling that he's not particularly welcomed in his homeland because of his various political ideals. Um, he, he was a very noted atheist. He wrote, wrote this pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism, and that was not taken at all wisely, uh, not, not taken at all well. Um, it was this pamphlet that actually got him expelled from Oxford. I say authored, he co-authored. Uh, a book with a, with a fellow university friend who it seems may actually have done most of the heavy lifting in that essay. Um, but they, so he was expelled by the aristocracy and he, sorry, expelled from Oxford and he grew up in aristocracy. Um, his, his father was kind of a, a very well off uh, member of parliament, landowner. Um, and his family really cut him off, disowned him. And indeed he disowned his family. It was, it was very mutual. Um, he was very open that if he ever inherited, when he inherited, which he thoroughly expected to, a significant amount of money, he was just going to give it away to those in need to, you know, set up various different um, different schemes that would uh, improve the lot of the poor. And, uh, for someone born into aristocracy, he is very often in his life in really critical po uh, poverty. And that never seems to bother him. He never seems to really see, uh, see that as a major problem and doesn't actually feel it in, in the way that uh, so many so many rich kids they'll never be like the common people um, but he does have this uh, he there he does have an ideology he has a a belief that money shouldn't be the rich up there and the poor down there um, 
so his his uh, his shocking behavior, his kind of writing this atheistic pamphlet and not only writing it, but sending it to uh, pretty much everybody in the university, certainly everybody of note in within the university, um, offending everyone that he could, being outspoken in his beliefs, um, meant that he was very, very badly received. He eloped with first with a girl called Harriet Westbrook, um, who was only 16 years old. I think he was 18 or 19 at that point, so that's not quite so bad. Um, astonishingly, that relationship didn't really last too long. They did have two children, um, but it didn't last particularly well. And by the time he is 21, he is eloping with uh, the then Mary Godwin, the subsequently Mary Shelley, um, who was also 16 at that time. Not, not really great. Um, and his first wife committed suicide after after a while, after she'd been left sort of various kind of... The, the debates of Harriet Shelley are very interesting and, and, and how she was treated by um, by subsequent commentators and uh, is a bizarre thing. There, there's a whole world there to get into kind of autobiographically, autobiographically, biographically, um, that I think it will be, you know, useful if you're interested. Um, but to, to just to give you an, a, an indication of how kind of publicly he was vilified and looked down on when his wife, um, so his wife committed suicide, he promptly married Mary Shelley in order to secure, um, you know, to, to look quite respectable and to secure the custody of his children and sort of went to go and get and actually was refused custody of his children. He, it was the first case in the history of English law of a father being denied custody of his children on the grounds of immorality. Um, they just said, no, you, you are an atheist, you are a rebel, you are a reckless person, you are not suitable uh, to be the father of these children. And that court case was actually the, became, was it one of the inspirations for Bleak House, for Charles Dickens's Bleak House, if, if you know that about these two wards who are in this long convoluted legal battle it was you know, really tragic what what happened to them that they never really got support they they didn't get looked after by their father they they weren't they weren't allowed to go to their mother's family either uh, it was a real kind of tragedy but it's very interesting to think of him being uh being being considered immoral because he is in a lot of ways an incredibly moral person he is uh He's a vegetarian, he doesn't drink, he believes in the kind of equal share of wealth. Um, whenever he has money, he just gives it to those he knows who who, who need it more than he does. Um, so he's he's got a lot of contradictions. Um, and in in a way, he people think of him as immoral because he doesn't he refuses to say things that other people feel. He refuses to just accept something. He has his own moral compass. Um, and it's very specific. And he's just like, well, okay, it's not yours. It's not your moral compass, but you know what? I'm not gonna pretend that I'm something that I'm not. So I think that's probably a nice bit, a little place to pause, and we shall come back in, look at a couple of the works themselves.